Uh, let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> And we have Spanish translation tonight. We have Esperanza Villegas. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Esperanza Villegas y estoy aquí para traducir. Si alguno de ustedes necesita ayuda, estoy en la parte trasera de esta sala. Gracias. Gracias. We also have um, headsets for the hearing impaired, as noted on the board. Uh, announcements of closed session action. We had, um, uh, we approved the Casey waivers um, with a vote. The motion was made by Harder, second by Parker. It was three in favor and two were absent at that point. Introductions, proclamations, presentations, recognitions. Good afternoon. I do have one presentation to make, and I believe Crystal Franco is our only recipient here. <laughs> Crystal, would you please come forward? Let me talk to the board about this. This is the national. <laughs> this is the National Hispanic Recognition Program, and I introduced a number of students to you at our last meeting based on their scores in the PSAT and the MN. NMSQT taken in their junior year, the College Board qualified a number of students for the National Hispanic Recognition Program. We had students selected this year from a pool of 124,000 students. Wow. Uh, there were four National Hispanic Scholars from San Marcos who we recognized last week. We also had of our seven National Hispanic Scholars from Dos Pueblos High School. We also had Michael Rivelas here at our last meeting. A number of other students were not able to be here. Ariel uh, Lafuente, uh, Jacqueline Rangel, Leah Morales, Sydney Vickery, and Joseph McDaniel. But we do have Crystal Franco with us tonight. And Crystal, we're proud of your accomplishments. Tell us, where are you headed next year? UC Santa Cruz. Well, congratulations to you, and we have a plaque to give you. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy your summer, and congratulations, and enjoy Santa Cruz. Um, very special place. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And if you'd like to see yourself on TV, will this one be broadcast on Saturday? Not on not, Saturday. Not on Saturday. It will be broadcast. You know It'll be broadcast at some time on Channel 8, <laughs> on channel 18, you can check we'll them. so you can check website. their schedule. <laughs> we know this. Surprise. That's it. Okay. Uh, any public comments? No. Okay. Consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes 5-0. I'd like to comment on it. I note the, uh, the retirement of Carlos Cohen from Marcus. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to say that uh, my son had him in class. I come to oh. Elementary. Mike, uh, there we go. He's a, uh, an excellent teacher, and I, w I certainly wish him well. Carlos Cohen, I'm talking about. We do have two retirements on here. Uh, Nancy Ellis uh, is with the district over 21 years as a secretary at DP, and Eleanor Jones, um, an elementary office coordinator who's been with the district for over 33 years from Harding Elementary. Oh my goodness. Okay, what we're here for, let's see, our action agenda. Um, E1, approval of business office efficiency study implementation plan. 
Eric Smith, our Deputy Superintendent, will give this presentation. This is the follow-up to what initially started as a review by School Services of California. We heard it at our last meeting, uh, respond, an item-by-item -item response to the recommendations made by School Services, and we told you that we'd bring you back a, um, an implementation plan so that you would know what the organizational structure would be and what positions uh, we were recommending. Eric? Thank you, Brian. Um, as the board knows, I went through this pretty much in detail at the last uh, board meeting. However, the things that have changed between then and now are you'll notice that we've lost the title of School Services of California in the hopes that if the board approves this, we'll embrace it as our own efficiency study implementation plan rather than an external agent imposing it upon us. So that's why you'll notice the absence of the reference to School Services of California in the title. The other thing, as I promised, uh, was basically the way we're going to pay for this, which is enumerated on the last page of the uh, efficiency study implementation plan, along with job descriptions for uh, two of the positions that are, um, we're asking that be created as a result of hopefully the adoption of the efficiency implementation plan. So I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. I think we went through this in pretty significant detail at the last meeting, and if you have questions, I can address those at this point. Actually, I did have a question. Uh, you've enumerated the, the dollars that you're you plan to use can you quickly walk us through the positions that are being added and the the amounts that are required for, to fund those positions sure there's actually two management positions and two classified positions and if you look starting on page 17 One of those positions is an internal auditor position. Right. At 83,000, I got that. Correct. Yes. Uh, one of them is a purchasing agent position at 83,000, okay. right below it. Okay. And actually, I probably did this in reverse. On page 14, you see the fiscal impact of 114,000. That's actually, there's a personnel technician and also a position control analyst, and that's the combined total for both of those positions. Okay. And then there's some small uh, compensation adjustments in there. I think six and eight thousand. Okay. And so that should reconcile to the two hundred and I believe ninety-four thousand okay. dollars. And then there's a one-time expense relative to the upgrade of the CEC system, the lease of a HP three thousand nine fifty-seven series, and the um, the training that needs to go along with that. I do have kind of an anecdotal piece of information with regard to that. Um, yesterday, I was talking to our director of fiscal, and she was extracting something out of the system. And I asked her, well, how long is that going to take? And she said 180 minutes. So based on the data we're getting from CECC, this would increase our processing time tenfold. So something that <laughs> took us 180 it would be 18 minutes now. So I thought that was significant. Thank you. Can I just clarify something that you said, Mr. Smith? Um, sure. So the purchasing, wait, I'm sorry. Um, the two positions on 14, the two technicians, accounting technician and personnel technician, those would be the, the classified, classified positions that you mentioned. And then the uh, purchasing coordinator and the internal auditor would be the two management positions. That's correct. OK. And as you recall, school services was also recommending that we create a purchasing manager position, uh, basically taking the purchasing coordinator or purchasing supervisor position out of the unit. And we didn't think we needed right. to do that. I, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, business office efficiency study implementation plan. Second. And could we make it clear that we're approving the job descriptions for the two management positions? Yes. as part of that all, all four of those positions the augmented position and then the one-time expense for the, the um, commission
computer upgrade. Second. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not going to vote for uh, in favor of this, and I would like to explain why. Um, the thing long and hard about it. We uh, we had a physical fiasco in the last year or so, and uh, and uh, as a response to that, we we uh, created a new position, deputy superintendent, and hired a first-rate person to, to fill it, and I. I, I can't fault us any for that. That's an appropriate solution. Uh, and then I, and on top of that, I see the creation of four new administrative positions in the central office. Uh, two. Two. I also look at our academic side, and I'm not going to use the word fiasco, but we have some major problems on our academic side. And I'm saying, why don't we have a crash program? Uh, why don't we have uh, proposals? for new positions that are going to fix the academics. And, uh, and I think, okay, well, maybe that's coming. But by the time it gets here, we will have used up four FTE. And we're still, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, headed towards additional budget reductions. Am I correct about that? I, I think we'll be able to present you with a balanced budget for 8-9. It looks fairly good for 9-10. The one wild card we have out there is health and welfare, but you have a cap. There'll be pressure to do something about it, but you're not obligated. See, I, 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 would, I would want to postpone any new positions for, uh, for the district office uh, until we're out of trouble uh, in terms of our financial position. Uh, I just, I, I can't as a matter of my sense of priorities. Uh, we're out of financial trouble, and, uh, and I'm deeply concerned about the recent data we've heard uh, about our academic performance and feel that we are, I, I understand the psychology of it. We, we're going to fix this, and, and, I, and I, I don't question at all Mr. Smith's recommendation that this is going to fix it. I'm just saying we're out of balance here, and, uh, and so I can't vote for it. I'd just like to share, I certainly don't, don't think that I could dissuade you, Dr. Noel, but I believe it's only two new positions. Two management positions. Two management That's positions. Um, but apart from that, these are recommendations that have been with us since we had the original FICMAT study. And we finally have someone who was competent enough to be able to put together a package to identify the, the savings in order to pay for what we have has been identified as needing to be done for the past seven years. So I just throw that out there, not in an attempt to convince you, just in, no, in terms of presenting some that. additional I, evidence. I look at it, I stand back and I say, what are we doing? Uh, we've cut a lot of money from the budget and, and I'm going to go to my constituents and they're going to say, then how, why did you hire all these administrative positions when they were still in the shadow of budget cuts? And I just can't, I can't come to that conclusion, that's all. May I address that concern? Uh, as you know, for the last two years, we've been showing you information about how we're staffed here in district office and that we're about at half the staffing level of other district offices with this many students in the district. Um, I understood your direction to be to continue to keep that lean. We eliminated two management positions. This brings back two management positions. I mean, we're really at a wash in terms of management positions just in the last six months. When School Services of California came, uh, their initial statement to me was that this is one of the leanest district offices we've seen anywhere. And their initial statement was, we think you, you need four more management positions just in business services. And we sat down with them to figure out how we could cover the needs and the responsibilities in business services with not four more management positions, but what turned out to be a recommendation for three and what is what we're asking you to act upon, which is only two. And we're keeping um, always at the forefront uh, a notion toward fiscal conservatism and fiscal responsibility in doing this. But the fact is that there are a lot of responsibilities here and we're just barely able to meet those responsibilities. And if you'd like us to gear up for bigger changes in education services, 
I would be happy to do that. I understood that your direction was to keep cutting back and really leave the sites to the, the process and the responsibility for making those changes and for us to support them in any way that we can. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a major item of discussion. Uh, I've also shown you staffing patterns for comparable districts that are, that are our size. And as you know, they all have many more management positions. You've been seeing those for the last year. Um, and I just wanted to chime in that I was actually very influenced you by you, Dr. Noel, um, as you, before I came on the board two years ago, um, because you spoke quite extensively about the fact that there had been a, this FICBAC report with all these suggestions that weren't implemented. And so coming into the School Services of California report, I, um, you know, I was really connecting the way you had connected with, we had all these great suggestions and then the board it was to save money, the board did not follow through with them. Um, so I personally will vote for this because I do think it's important that we follow through with these recommendations this time. I, I, as I, you know, I'm just explaining my position. I, I have great faith in, in Mr. Smith. I think we've, he's already implemented reforms uh, before hiring these new people that, that are quite, uh, quite respectable. And uh, my, my priorities would limp along with that until we, uh, uh, till we're out of, clearly out of long-term financial trouble. So, uh, and, and my problem is that I, I live with a lot of data. I'm doing a lot of research uh, on school performance and on measures of school performance. And our district just isn't doing well. And uh, that's been acknowledged here. I have data that I have not shared with you at this point uh, till I double check it and triple check it because it is so bad that I, I, I want to be sure before I share it with you. But, we are not doing well for our students. We're certainly not doing well for our English learners. Mr. Uh, Dr. Hayden's uh, report uh, is indeed depressing, uh, and uh, and I don't see I don't see an analogous program. Uh, I see a big hunk of, of general funds going away, and uh, it's just where I am in my particular priorities and position. I uh, any opposed? No. So it passes four one. Uh, e two approval of resolution o seven o eight four one public employees retirement system golden handshake. As we've been telling you for a while, we have the possibility of a golden handshake, and uh, to describe how that fits into the overall scheme and our budget cuts from April. I'll let Eric Smith, our deputy superintendent, describe it. As you recall, the PERS Golden Handshake was one of the areas identified in the long-term and fiscal health analysis section of the fiscal recovery plan. And basically the way the Golden Handshake works for classified employees is that rather than having additional health and welfare benefits bestowed on them, the district actually pays for two years of additional service credit. For the PERS Golden Handshake to pencil out, you have to quantify that there's going to be a cost savings, and usually the differential in the cost savings among classified employees is not material, so usually you have to end up attriting some of those positions. So through an extensive negotiating process with CSEA, we identified certain positions that would be basically attrited if people retired out. We would not replace those positions. And that's how the retirement savings or ongoing cost savings would be affected. One of the things I'd like to explain is that the first thing we did is in conjunction with CSEA is we circulated basically a questionnaire saying based on, you know, your age and years of service credit, you're eligible. If we offer this, do you have any interest? And we've got so many responses. And since the way the program works is that after the board takes its action, the county board has to take an action, and then a minimum, a minimum of a 90-day and a maximum, I believe, of a 180-day window actually opens, and we would be recommending a 90-day where those people who are eligible could basically submit or retire within that window. So basically, the cost analysis you have is the worst-case scenario. We do not think that all these people will retire, so both our cost analysis 
and basically if some of the people don't retire that we've basically slated for attrition, these numbers will change and we would bring that back after the 90 days is actually closed. But since we have to disclose worst case, what you're seeing is basically if everybody retired, what we would pay f t PERS over two years, and then after those two years, the ongoing savings we get in perpetuity, I should say the district accrues in perpetuity. So what you're basically doing is using one-time money because we would actually suggest that you use ending balance money to make the payment, and then after the second years of payment to PERS, those numbers of employees that were basically attrited out, you would accrue that as a budget savings. I have a question. What happens if the retirements cluster in particular areas, let's say custodial services, so that you reach a point where you can't offer appropriate amounts of services? Well, remember, we've kind of systematically looked at this with CSEA. You're not attriting all the positions, so your savings are a combination of replacement salary savings and attrition. There's only like five positions that have been identified for full attrition. And we had, the, we had the ability, CSEA and us, to identify by job families, but we decided not to go that way because I think once we circulated the original questionnaire, you know, we thought that it, what we tried to do was identify unrestricted general fund, but for the most part, we didn't want to start getting broken down into families. Do you have any other estimates besides the worst case scenario? <laughs> no, we won't know that. I think the worst case is, you know, worst case. Um, basically, we won't know until the 90 days opens up and people, you know, submit. So I guess the real issue is on a multi-year, you're not going to see the benefit of this until 2010-11. That's when you're going to see, you know, close to $300,000 ongoing savings. But you're taking some one-time money out of your ending balance to pay for it. Well, that uh, raises the question that I had, which was because I, I think if I'm re reading the numbers correctly, we're looking at about maybe 300 about something thousand, 330 thousand dollars. Yeah, well, actually, I would take the 440 less the 276, so you're basically taking a hit of about you know 191 in both years because right. you can factor in what the savings are. You're just not getting the full accrual of those savings until after. So given that we don't see the savings for two, several years. Two years. Two, two years down the road. What is the benefit of doing this now in a, in a year where we've had to make cuts and we're well, sort of looking at, at, at cash flow that's relatively restricted rather than perhaps waiting a, a year or two when our uh, financial situation might we I mean obviously we don't know it could get worse but right. um, maybe would be a little bit more stable I, I think the benefit is is that right now we're probably looking at about an eight percent ending balance and you have some one-time money there to do this I mean you might not have that I mean if you if you spend that down over the next few years you couldn't do it so you know it's obviously those are all good questions any other questions Okay, ready to vote then? There, there wasn't any public comment, right? No. I'll move to approve resolution number 2007 08 41, Public Employees Retirement System Golden Handshake. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nope. Passes 5 0. We're on to E3. Um, second reading and adoption of the revised board policy on business and non-instructional operations or the 3000 series. You've seen these policies before. We're bringing them back to you with whatever changes uh, you had for us and we're ready to go through the new set of policies here. We'd like to replace the old ones with the new ones rather than go item by item and, and change some small wording. Many of the old policies are years old, um, 1972, 1988, uh, they go back there. And there's some that, that we have adopted in just the last couple of years. Do you want me to go page by page? 
Um, should we go section? Anybody have a suggestion? Yeah, just do it the I same old way. I think you're just going to have to do it the same old way. Same old way. Yeah. Okay. Um, any on anything on BP three thousand concepts and roles, page one, two. Uh, oh, oh, one. Nope. You, want, you have a suggestion. Yeah, just to call out the page number. Okay. I think it'll move faster. Just than do the page every number. single. Okay. Yes. Um, anything on page three, four, five. I have something on five. Okay. Just a consistency issue on eight. There's still a reference to assistant superintendent where it's been changed to deputy throughout the rest. Well, and and if we make a change later today. Uh, regarding uh, assistant superintendent to associate superintendent, the consistency of that would have to be changed as well. Okay. okay. Six, seven. There's just a typo, an extra S at the top of page seven after districts. <laughs> Eight, nine, ten. First line in page ten, there's an extra T in the line uh -huh. just sitting there by itself. Yeah. 11, 12, 13, 14, no, 15, 16, 17. My next highest is 34. Can anybody? <laughs> this is like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. That's what I need is get us ahead. Can I just make sure? Everybody skip to around and look and see if 34. Okay, 34. Um, on the two bottom paragraphs, the second to the last paragraph, all purchases of other items for more than 10,000, but less than, and it strikes out 69,000 maximum competitive bid. But in the next paragraph down, it still says 69,000. Should it say next competitive yeah, bid? Okay. I caught that too. Okay. Yes. I like that too. <laughs> okay. Anything else on 34, 35, 36? And I have 40. Okay, anything else between there and 40? Nope, go ahead with 40. Well, sometimes you mark these and you wonder later why you mark them. <laughs> um, about halfway down, above the numbered items, it says competitive bids shall be sought through advertisement for contracts exceeding $69,000. Same change? Um, Maximum competitive bid or a different amount? No, actually that would be... Actually, the problem is is that fifteen thousand is the threshold for base for okay. public works, and that hasn't changed unless you adopt uniform cost accounting method. No, okay. So we can okay. go with that. Okay. No change so, then. So we can go with sixty-nine thousand. Well, hold on. Let me look at this real quick because <laughs> they're mixing. They're mixing. Yeah. No, you're right, because that refers to materials and equipment, so it, it, it is, it's the same as 34. Okay. Yeah. They refer to the 15,000 in the first paragraph, so they mix their two bids, thresholds. Okay. All right, so okay. for 41, 42. 40, 42 and 43, the header ended up at the bottom of the page. It just yeah. needs to be shifted over to the next page. I had a... A minor thing on 43 as well. Um, number eight, we change district to districts um, without changing the pronoun to reflect making it plural. <laughs> mm -hmm. 44, 45. Well, How about next highest it, page? It's just anybody? plural there. 47. Right? Did you want an apostrophe? I'm sorry. Uh, no. Mine, are you referring yeah. to? Yes. Say that again. Dr. Sarvis? Yes. Um, when we say the districts at, it should be at their discretion rather than at its discretion. Uh, okay. Let's see. Number eight? Yes. Thank you. 44, 45. My, my next is 83. Nope, I, I got 47. Okay. So. 47. We had that, uh, the note in the beginning about the contracts and whether we wanted to put that in writing anywhere. There was a note. Um, uh, from 
It was the memo from Craig Yeah, from Craig, from Craig Price. Price. Um, so whether we want to actually say something from this in here, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's necessary or not. Well, does anyone? No, I think, I think originally the question was raised, should all contracts be reviewed by an attorney? And what he, Craig is saying is it can be done on a discretionary level. And whether we want to say that on here, but in a case by case or whether just to leave it out. Okay. I had a question on this page too, though, just in that very first paragraph, um, where we uh, revert back to using the the singular of the district. Well, <laughs> there was a note at the very beginning of all these policies saying that that had that change needed to occur throughout. It hadn't occurred in all of them. Yeah. But we will make that. Barbara's change nodding her head because she's okay. the one who's going to have to make okay. the changes. Yeah. Thank you for noting that, though. Okay, 48, 40, oh, you had, your next one was in 80? 83, I don't Can we just, um, I'm not sure I, give, it, give us a second to get up to 83. Okay. I don't think there's anything with the forms. Okay, go ahead, 83. Just a question about uh, in the second paragraph whether $200 is the appropriate amount for petty cash, and then there's a symbol in between that <laughs> sentence and the next one that needs to be Secret code deleted. <laughs> but $200 is the usual standard? That's a, that's a good question. You know, it varies. I, I mean, I don't think you want to go any higher than about 500. Yeah. I've seen it as low as 100. So, oh, interesting. So we could go to 500. I just, 200 probably sounds right for an elementary school. I'm just wondering if 200 is the right amount for yeah, a secondary school on any given day when you're collecting money for PE uniforms or. Well, we could make that distinction 200 for elementary and 500 for secondary or something like that, or that two and 400 or. Okay. Two and 400. Two and 400? Yeah. So that's, that's. I like that. Two and 400. Do we need to make that uh uh, I guess we can change that here, and then if when we vote on these, we can just include that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you get that, Barbara? Okay. Good. Okay, any for next one? Anyone? Otherwise, I'm 106 is my next one. Okay, anything before 106? Anybody? Um, oh, I had a question on 104. Okay, uh, the cellular phone reimbursement, and I—I um, I guess I just didn't realize that we reimbursed employees, and um, just didn't know about this. Um, I'm wondering how many employees have cell phones, and that we actually reimburse them. Actually, they have district-provided cell phones, and in some cases, people are carrying two cell phones. They're carrying their own personal, and they're calling, carrying a district-issued one. And is that like all the principals get a cell phone? And I believe all the principals have cell phones. Okay. Okay. Just curious. That was all. No, I'm sorry. I don't see the reimbursement. Uh, is it right at the page 104? The heading: cellular phone reimbursement. It's kind of an either-or oh, proposition. So if, if you're not, <laughs> and actually this stemmed from some IRS auditing around this issue. So basically, if you're not issued a cell phone, you have the option to use a personal cell phone and basically submit for reimbursement. But most people actually utilize district issued and we do monitoring of that. Actually, I just saw something that Brian Tang we sent through with respect to monitoring of some of the phones. So, so if we, we ex see excessive charges or if we see what we think is personal use, we call them on it. So do we have to provide reim uh, reimbursement allowance? Well, I think we can do that. I, I'm not sure that has to be an administrative reg. I think that's just a day-to-day. -day. We would probably basically look at actual expense if it was deemed to be in the course of conducting school business, and we would reimburse them on that basis. But like I said, almost everybody uses district-issued cell phones. Yes. Um, 
then 106. Um, a question, and maybe I just didn't read this thoroughly enough, but uh, we don't want any smoking to take place on our campuses. Is that correct? And I'm just, it keeps naming these different instances. Wouldn't it be simpler to state somewhere at the top, just no smoking on any, you know, do you, you know, do you see what I'm saying? It enumerates all these instances. And I'm thinking in particular that if someone uh, was using a school facility by a civic center permit, that's not listed here. So could then they, they then smoke uh, under those circumstances? Wouldn't it be better just to include some blanket language saying? Just start with a blanket statement yes. that we prohibit the use of tobacco on any school any facility. School facilities Do, yeah. Doesn't that say that in the second campus. paragraph? It does it say that? So I, I'm, well, it almost seems it, to me that the third paragraph should go. Okay, well then. Because then, the second paragraph already says it. Great, okay. Yeah, and one of the issues that Whatever's always comes make up clear. is that, you know, somebody's driving in a vehicle can they can smoke and it's actually there it's called out that you can't smoke in a district vehicle too okay. so i think that's helpful okay so maybe it's just the order in which that paragraph is placed maybe it should be at the, at the beginning right well i, or I think something just else eliminate eliminate paragraph three okay because it should be clear from paragraph two that that's it's all inclusive all times. I think it might be appropriate to leave the part that says this prohibition applies to all employees, students, and visitors. Yeah, um, just leave useful. out the that rest of it. Mm -hmm. Useful clarification. Yeah. Anytime, anywhere, anyone. Right. <laughs> that's the anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's what I was looking for. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excuse me, board members. Mm -hmm. I think the last time we had the discussion, there was there was talk of that third paragraph applying to activities that occurred off of school campuses. Well, that's what I was going to ask because we you normally have com have language that says um, on or off campus, um, and th but then I thought this one seemed to be only referring to on campus, so I didn't know if that language school was appropriate. Yeah, sponsor. I, I, well, how about just leaving paragraph three? I mean, it, it well, further clarifies in well, addition to facilities. Well, except it doesn't. If it means off campus, then we need to add the off campus. Well, I, I'm actually wondering if that's a different uh, See, BP in, that's in what the I student thought. section uh, rather than uh, this is about the facilities. Um, it would be nice to have that cross-referenced if it, if it exists. Um, so maybe we could check into that. Yeah, I, I think you're right because generally most school district boards adopt this policy so they're in compliance with federal funding requirements. And so if you're dealing with a student oriented policy, it probably would be elsewhere. And you know, if you're gonna prescribe although, something with respect to school sponsored activities off campus. Although I would hope that it would apply to our staff as well on off campus activities. In, in what sense? You mean with students? I'm assuming. Yeah, when when our when yeah. our for example when our staff are are working an off campus activity that they would not be <coughs> smoking as well. Right, and that might be in the um, four thousand series. Yeah, I agree with you that I, I looked at that and decided that I thought it really didn't fit here because I thought this was really focusing on the facilities. But I think we need to make sure that that language is somewhere. You might want to put volunteers, if you leave in the third paragraph, employees, students, visitors, or volunteers also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, there's another policy later on that has to do with uh, driving on field trips, and it prohibits smoking in their own personal car with students in the car. Mm -hmm. So volunteers would be appropriate. So how does this third paragraph read right. now? Right. Cooking. How does the third paragraph read? Applies to all employees, students, volunteers, volunteers and, and visitors. visitors and instructional activity. It's just the same, add and volunteers. And, and then, are, so are you keeping everything after it or just yeah, ending it at visitors? I would just delete after visitors, but. Uh, or just put a period? It. Yeah, I would delete the add any instructional activity, et cetera. But I don't know. Dr. Service, you thought that there was a valid reason for keeping that? 
Well, this is the primary section that says we're a tobacco-free environment. And I know that it starts out uh, by talking about, uh, in the second paragraph, by talking about district property and district vehicles. Uh, but it, it's our primary uh, policy on saying we don't allow the use of tobacco by anyone, anywhere, uh, whether it is a school facility or whether it's some uh, related event that's a school event. Um, I would opt <laughs> to add volunteers to the third paragraph. I would also opt to, after athletic event, uh, to add off-campus event so that it's very clear that we don't allow it anywhere. But then that should be cross-referenced to the student and, section. Yes. yes. And yes. in addition to this, under student safety, we need to have a strong statement for students as well. Okay. Okay. But I, I actually think if you're going to start talking about off-campus events, that that's going to need more clarification than just this because... Um, well, uh, off-campus school event? You know, I'm uh, actually, I, I think it's covered under school-sponsored school activity. activity right. yeah. And maybe we don't need that. Right. In the, it kind of infers in the fourth paragraph down though when it says um, while students are on campus or while attending, while attending school sponsored activities, that by putting or it infers that it's not on campus. Yes. Well, I don't, it's not don't real need, clear, but <laughs> <laughs> it says it. We probably don't need another statement about off school events. So in other words, right now, paragraph three is staying as it is, except for we're adding in the word volunteers. With volunteers. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Slowly get to 139. Can, can I just ask Dave a question? On 125, those charges with respect to rekeying, are those appropriate? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Mr. Smith, we did review those at, at the second reading. And in fact, uh, they did, uh, we did change them and clarify them, but not only. Uh, as it said previously, for lost key, but uh, all of the additional key ways which would require rekeying. Okay. Which can add up to quite a bit. <laughs> I had just a sort of a language question actually on that one. Um, on the top of page 125, it says, keys shall be used only by authorized employees and shall never be loaned or issued to students or non-district employees. And then we have a series of sort of exceptions to that. Contractors. That we, we can give it to contractors. We can give it to students with dis disabilities. We can give it to city uh, uh, staff. And so I was wondering if we might not have something that says with the following exceptions. Because the list seems to contradict the statement that just came before it. We could do that at the end of the first sentence. Keys shall be used only by authorized employees uh, with the following exceptions, then bullet the students with disability. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be okay to say, and shall never be loaned. Department. I think we can keep that whole sentence and then just say, with the following exceptions. Or, 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 could, or we, could we say, and shall never be loaned or issued to unauthorized students or non-district employees? And then it goes, I, well, I kind others. of like the idea of how it's stated because I think the point is that we're, we're as a rule, we're not going to issue them to anybody, who, to a student or anybody who's mm -hmm. not employed by the district. But we do have these three exceptions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we might say, except in the following cases or something like that. Mm -hmm. Good. Page 139, I think, is where we're at now. Right, item 3D. Um, it says identification of at least one person at each site who holds valid certificate and first aid and car cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't be identifying a ratio for elementary, for junior high, and for high school. If there truly was a disaster at a, and a high school campus was involved, one person <laughs> with a certification wouldn't 
nearly be adequate enough. And I know that we've been working on first aid and cardiopulmonary resuscitation classes for staff members. So, I mean, I know we want to approve these tonight, but I'm wondering if it might be better to survey sites and see who is how many qualified people they have on each campus and come up with some sort of appropriate ratio. Well, at all of our secondary sites, all of our coaches are qualified. I, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, coaches are qualified, that's true. But uh, PE instructors are qualified, okay. we know that. Okay. And we know that our uh, health assistants are qualified and many of our administrators are qualified. Can I go back to 129 when you're done with them? Sure. 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 What do we want to do with this? Uh, at least 129? No, no. Well, at least I one doesn't sound like enough. No. I agree. I, I think it'd be worth approving it um, so we have the, the policy approved and the AR approved tonight, but with the uh, intentions of doing maybe that kind of a study of looking at how many people are certified on each campus, kind of determining whether, as Mrs. Harder says, a ratio might be a more appropriate mm -hmm. target, um, and then coming back, and then we can just amend this portion of it. Mm -hmm. And then it would have to be linked to each school's emergency plan so that Good. they what knew from one year to the next that they had the right number of trained personnel on yes. each campus. Uh, we could do that. We could go forward with this item and then bring this item back for further consideration. Okay. Let's go back to 129 then. Uh, I just don't, there's something here that I'm sure that you can explain it, but it's saying the principal or designee may direct a person to leave campus and then it gives the reasons why. Then, then it says this shall not apply if a person is a student a school employee or other person required by his employment to be on campus, but some of the reasons why include uh, uses loud and or offensive language which could provoke a violent reaction. Uh, can't ask a student to leave campus for that reason or, or an employee. employee. And uh, it just, uh, it seemed like an, a, a little anomalous. Interfere with peaceful conduct, discipline, good order. All, all those are good reasons to ask anybody to leave campus. And then I'm thinking the answer lies in Ed Code 4481 four yeah. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> and <laughs> you, you may know something that I don't know. Not I have off the top of my head. Well, we can bring that one back as well with an answer to that. May, may I comment that we have a sexual offenders policy that was not presented to you today. It's still under advisement by our attorneys, and it may affect the uh, paragraph following uh, number three. So I just bring that to your attention. Okay. Well, we'll maybe see this again, that page. Okay, so now we're up back to 139. Mm. Uh, well, it sounds like we'll bring both of those policies back. Mm -hmm. Well, can we pass 139, uh, page one, that yeah, AR I have right no now, and then, to that and then and change then it? Get back to it, yeah. You, so meant you said 139? Okay. Yeah. So 120, 29, I think we're going to pull and bring back. One. Thirty-nine, we're okay with. Yeah. Okay, so one. Four, any? I'm up to one sixty-one then. Okay, anyone before one sixty-one? Let's slowly get up there. I, it's it's okay. not that I have any specific change to recommend. I just want to note that the savings in transportation is, uh, I assume, being reaped because we've changed the distances, correct? Well, the, sa the savings will be reaped because we enforce the distances, not okay. that they're changed. And as you remember, that was a component of the fiscal recovery plan. So when we actually developed this AR, we did it consistent with what the board approved in the fiscal recovery plan. Okay, so, but 
I guess I just want to make it more explicit that this was the practical effect of what we approved. Absolutely. Okay. We used this AR in the because language Because it's, it's a significant AR. increase for elementary. Well, um, and also, at towards the end of last year, for a time on the secondary campuses, bus passes will were not available at the school sites. So this fall, they will be available again in the Absolutely school sites. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Sixty-four. So anybody want a next page on? I just want to, okay, never mind, no, that was not. Oh, uh, I, I'm, I'm up to 197. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> give us a second, give us a second. Okay. 197. Um, on 197, under the underlined portion, well, is it the underlined portion? Um, it, it talks about, you know, the, the restrictions surrounding uh, food sales and specifically <coughs> competitive food sales. But I know that it's informal practice for students who are uh, involved in fundraisers in out-of-school organizations or just students who are entrepreneurial to bring candy to campus and sell it. It okay. happens at the junior high. Um, and there's nothing in here that applies to individual students. It talks about organizations, it talks about student organizations and, and that sort of thing. Well, it, or, well, or I suppose individual teachers too. I, I don't know. But doesn't it say it in the first, you know, food sales are prohibited during school hours? Doesn't that apply to everybody? And, and then once again, it highlights different things. And I'm not sure whether someone reading this would know that it prohibited individuals from doing that very same thing. Why don't we add that language to the AR? We, we can do that. That individual students may not bring, you know, I think it would be. I think campus. it would be extremely helpful. For the yeah. Is of it at certain foods or is it anything? I mean, well, they're they're not going to bring a tossed green salad to sell <laughs> to their friends. <laughs> you are so wrong, Mrs. Hart. <laughs> <laughs> I do it every day. <laughs> Kids are trading lunches. I'm not sure that's um, that's not really selling. It's bartering. That, that <laughs> and you know, there's no way to prohibit that. I'm talking about kids who go to Costco and buy a box of candy bars or you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever happens to be popular at that point in time and, mm -hmm. and yes. brings it to school to sell. It's still enforcement may be difficult at the yeah. high school level. It would be nice to have the language though, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I, but I would think if, as Ms. Sarder was saying, if we're gonna have the, um, if we're gonna add that language about individuals, I would prefer to just leave it at individuals and not say individual students because it could be staff or faculty right. or even volunteers. So where exactly does it go? Well, probably under the AR on other food sales. I mean, w we could develop a section there just for that purpose. It addresses in one paragraph it, uh, at the bottom of the page under uh, of that uh, precedes the one two designation. It talks about students uh, of the school, you know, selling as part of a you know sanctioned fundraising event, mm -hmm. but it doesn't cover unsanctioned uh, sales. Mm -hmm. I think the only question would be the uh, specification as to what kind of food. Well, uh, but maybe, then maybe it, but we're talking about any food. Even if they're selling a, a or, green salad, yes, then that is, a com that is in direct competition with the cafeteria. That's right, and that's one of our big problems with uh, student stores, for example, Correct. or some of the academies right. that might be selling things is right. 
as money makers that it keeps kids away from eating healthy foods. Okay, we'll, we'll bring that back. Okay, do you have another page to go to? I have 209, 209, 210, 211. Okay, go ahead. Uh, someone who has read the code more recently than I can, can answer this, I'm sure. Uh, but my recollection is that you, we have to have approved and have on file a documents retention schedule. And if that is correct, I don't, I see some of the language of that, the classification of types of documents, but I don't see the retention idea, the schedule idea. And, and so, I, first of all, I, I'm not sure my memory is correct. No, but your memory is correct. Yeah, I mean, that is correct. And, and I'm, because I'm wondering uh, where that uh, is. It, it, was, it also involved, uh, you know, storage and fees for retrieval right. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then the, which and, was in and, her and the other piece of this is, is that and then, uh, the, at least one point here, it requires agreement between the board and the superintendent of course agreement between the board and the superintendent has to be public and I and I just don't recall ever doing any of this in a board meeting and uh, and, and, I, and it makes me wonder we so we put this policy in place have we done it are we in compliance with our policy uh, or do we, or does this mean the day after we vote for the policy in the AR we have to go back through and make sure that that we're that we're in compliance with the policy. I can just address what our department's doing. We use the CASBO records retention manual, which basically would ref pretty much reflect what's going on here. But we've been dealing with, you know, the items with respect to contracts and collective bargaining agreements and audits, basically consistent with what that says, which reflects what is here. I don't know what the rest of the district's doing. I can just tell you what's happening in the financial arena. And actually, we just purchased and updated that in the last three or four months. And Alma's been working on that. I mean, this does have, you know, if your class one is permanent, if it's class two, you keep it until you change the classification to class three. In class three, you keep for three years. But what falls into those classes? I, I, re I recall, like, I, I read one from the city or something, and it actually well, had time, had time frames. Right. We did have that one that had the retrieval fees and... It was and that a storage. Previous, <coughs> yeah. Board policies had all that. That was almost like an exhibit. Frankly, maybe I'd rather an exhibit have that could be attached. More to. of the information about the schedule right here in the AR, mm -hmm. so yeah. we don't have some separate process that we go through. Mm -hmm. And that schedule is probably delineated in the back of that book, and, and we can probably get that and just attach it. Or reference it. Or reference it. We can do that as well. Well, do we, do we have such a schedule? Or? Yes. We, we we're, we're, we're operating with that right. schedule, yeah. but I'm not sure it's ever been board approved, but it's kind of industry standard to use that guide, the yeah. records retention manual that CASBO issues to do this. And I know that for personnel records and for official board, well, for instance, minutes uh, for board agendas. That's all class one stuff. Yeah, yes, yeah. and we use our historical... Uh, <laughs> In other words, Julie's memory on how we're <laughs> we're handling that. But uh, the one I remember, I mean, it literally talks about this shall be kept for a year, maybe disposed of after a year, and the other one says longer. Right, and one, three, five. Too. Actually, yeah, I yeah, just I had a conversation with Alma about uh, agreement the other day, and we looked it up, and it, we had to, we were ready to toss it, but it was five years we had to keep it. So, yeah. and it was only like three so years. It was it transpired. rather surprising what you have to keep for five years. My recollection. Yes. Dr. Melikoff, if mm -hmm. I may, yes. the same kind of regulations apply to student records. Uh, I do not believe that we currently have language governing the, uh, the student records, but we'll provide you that information. There is a schedule that we are following. Yeah, and I believe that some of the records, like attendance and things, are for forever. 
because somebody can come back and assert that they need to show that they graduated from a high school. And this, I, I mean, I've had that happen 60 it's, years later. It's in know? here as a class one. The records of enrollment and scholarship for each student is class one. Right, there's not much question about class one. These are permanent records. Was there, Dr. Noel, was there something else on this what? part? No, no, I have just uh, okay, that was it. trying to reconcile what I saw here with my, my memories. I, I, increasingly, they're coming back to me about specific things that I saw. And it was in the city's, city. you go in the city and ask, do you have a documents retention policy? Here you are, sir. Like that. I thought it was this. <laughs> okay, we're, we'll bring that back. Okay, something else to bring back. Uh, I think we're done, unless everybody, anybody else. So, uh, this is hard to know how to make a motion here, but um, perhaps with this, those things that were not brought back. <laughs> There's a good one. Yeah, back. because uh, go ahead. I was going to move to approve the, uh, well, let me start by, I guess, move to delete our previous, our old um, 3000 series. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5-0. Okay, and then I will move to approve the new 3000 series of board policies and administrative regulations um, with the exception of the two that we pulled, which are, I I oh, were there three? three? I'm three. sorry, three that we pulled. Well, I, I actually have four administrative regulations yes. that we're planning to bring back to right. you. Right, okay. Could you tell us? And could you yeah. identify what those are? 3516, 3515.2, 3554.2, and 3580. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay do I hear I'll a second. second? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 5 0. Good. So we move on to E4 uh, approval of a contract for the Associate Superintendent for Education. At the June 10 board meeting, the board approved a reorganization plan for educational services, which included an upgrade uh, for the current uh, assistant superintendent for elementary education to associate superintendent for education. Uh, it was an upgrade both in salary and a significant increase in the number of responsibilities that that person uh, would carry. The list of the responsibilities, which we've seen before, is included. And what we have uh, in front of you is the contract. This is parallel contract language to uh, the deputy superintendent, uh, parallel in many ways to the superintendent's contract language. And it is on for your approval today. I think I had all of my questions asked uh, and answered previously, um, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Any other discussion? No? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm abstaining. Okay, so it's four with one abstention. All right. Um, board action on student expulsion case number 0708-19. 19, uh, so move uh, to uh, approve the stipulated agreement. Second. Okay. Mm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Passes 5-0. And then the um, uh, 07 90 uh, move to approve uh, the uh, expungement. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes 5-0. Well, we're scheduled for a break at this point. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you want to keep moving or do you want to break? Oh, break. Break, okay. We're broke. <laughs> <laughs>
second half here. Our conference agenda and our first item is to review and revisit the board mission statement. Well, this item is one of the other reasons that we decided to have a, a special workshop type meeting. Um, the last district mission statement, the one on the wall behind me, was adopted in 1995-96. Uh, and you can see its content. As part of this board agenda item, we provided samples of mission statements from various school districts. Uh, we provided the uh, the related materials, especially the board policy on our mission statement, board policy on philosophy and goals for the district. We also provided information on what had been in the uh, on the website and ha still is on the website as our district strategic plan and information on the board focus goals, which are really a follow-up to the mission statement. So once you have a mission statement in place and on a periodic basis, uh, the board would go through the board focus goals, which was the intention of the board policy on this. Two of the board members have done extra duty here and have taken a look at mission statements. Uh, Ms. Harder and Ms. Cordero have uh, provided a draft based on they're looking at other mission statements based on their thinking through our mission statement and you have that draft in front of you it's marked F1 uh, there are extra copies for the audience on the side table <laughs> <laughs> and, and <laughs> yes and Ms. Harder m maybe you would like to uh, to address this Thank you so much for the work you did sure, on this. No, In um, fact, uh, I took a careful look at it. I like it. Uh, and I had intended to go through and make revisions and bring it back to the board. I'm sorry, but the, no, no, actually, <laughs> that was just my original intent. We sat down together with, and we had both identified, uh, Ms. Cordero and I, uh, we had both identified the, the things that we liked from the ones that were shared. Um, but we had also investigated a number of, of other um, mission statements uh, looking at surrounding districts and other districts that you just pull out of the top of your head because you know somebody there or there's something about that district that you admire or, you know, whatever. So that was sort of the, the approach. And, and oddly enough, I, I won't make any bones about copying. A lot of this is from ORCIDs. Um, and they had done, I think, a really extraordinary job. And uh, what most districts are doing nowadays, because they don't want a mission statement that's a mile long, is, uh, and we both agreed that we would like a shorter mission statement, uh, they then uh, have shared values or principles or some additional statements connected to the mission statement. And then your, uh, the, um, board focus goals would flow from the mission statement and these um, articulated, uh, these articulated uh, explicit uh, values. So that was the direction that we went in. And really the, the first item under the shared values is, the first item is really more of a preamble um, because it says we believe um, and then the rest of the items say we will, um, which suggest the, the direction that we would then take uh, with our board focus goals. But I think we hit all of the, the high points. We certainly tried to include all the things that we thought were, were significant, uh, things that we, that we thought were embedded in our current mission statement, but maybe not stated as as well as we would like or in a way that so anyways um we really did look at a lot of different statements and pulled and and plagiarized freely from uh whatever we thought was what was worth uh, embedding in ours mm -hmm. so but and but even given that i do i do want to say uh we certainly uh, recognize that we want other board members to have input into this and um, make comments. One thing that I noticed that I didn't catch when we were doing this, and I really just noticed it now, is that we haven't specifically referred to 
um, to technology uh, or or um, kind of like uh, um, what am I trying to think? Other kinds of uh, up updating things, you know, systems, computer systems, etc. So. Uh, I don't know if there's anything, if that, I think that might be embedded in our changing world. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what we thought, that's what we were thinking. So we didn't state it ex explicitly, but I don't know if any, I noticed that it is explicit in our current language. I don't know if any, if we feel like we need to make it explicit in this one. Um. I, I'm going to think about the mission statement here. For the shared values, I think what I would personally like to do is to go back, and I don't know how much you guys referred to the core values in the strategic plan, um, and just see if there, if it ties, how it ties in, um, if there's um, uh, additions or subtractions that I would suggest there. But that's going to take me more time, obviously, than just mm -hmm. sitting here at the meeting. Um, but let me think about the mission statement. Well, then maybe, that's, maybe that's the next, yeah, the next step is to, to you know, bring it back. people to be able to digest it, come back with changes or suggestions, and, and also to, to weigh it against the, uh, the core values of the strategic plan. And I'm not married to that I, that title of shared values. They're, they had all kinds of there were all kinds of different phrases, core values, shared values, core principles, and there were all kinds of permutations um, that districts use. Well, since we just got this to read just a few seconds ago, that's why we're all sort of <laughs> sitting here. I think um, I re really impressed with the first part, the mission statement. I think that's great. I I'm not convinced that we need even need the shared values, but um, I'm not sure. I guess I need some time to think about it. Well, I kind of agree. Re unless there's something that just immediately jumps out at people, maybe we should just bring it back and have time to really look at it. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, uh, please. And, and uh, they're a little bit wide-eyed. I, I, I'm not sure what a what a set of uh, desiderata for a, a mission statement are, but uh, one question I have is: Should it be should it be something that is accountable? Uh, should it should it be something that, uh, in terms of which the school board and the school district could be held accountable? Would be, be a better way to put it, because that makes a big difference. And see, th this one this one says it's to maintain high expectations and a commitment. Okay, so is that what we're accountable for? Uh, another alternative, which I've, I haven't seen, uh, uh, is uh, results. Uh, are we accountable for, for outcomes? And, do we, and is, that, is it at the level of a mission statement that that uh, comes in? I, I, guess I, I guess I would say that I see a mission statement as the blue sky. And what you're talking about falls more under the goals portion. Um, you know, this is, you know, blue sky. This is what flows from the bl blue sky, and then the focus goals are how we're going to make the rubber meet the road. Yeah, but if it's blue sky, then you can't say whether you're achieving your mission or not achieving. Your but you can't through your goals. You can say I you're think achieving goals, your goals. That's yeah. Goals level. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think typically mission statements are not measurable. The, I, I've never seen a mission statement that is stated in measurable terms. Well, I, I, San Diego's got one here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Becoming America's best. Mm -hmm. that's, me that's measurable. Or, or Venturas. I mean, you, to my mind, you can set the bar a little low. Well, uh, I, I don't know if we all noticed in that the article about Rick DeFore from this last board brief where he talks about the, the mission statement, how it's just, yeah. it's, Nothing that anybody could ever disagree with. You ever, it's what it, you want for yeah. your district, Motherhood. but it's it's your goals yeah. where yeah. You, yeah. you need to set a specific target. Yes. But it's supposed to inspire. Then it's, it's not an accountability yeah. statement. It's an in, it's an inspirational statement. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. And I've heard Rick. Well, you help me clarify. 
speak directly to <laughs> that. The desiderata, say, which I guess you guys don't like that yeah. word. But. I liked it. I laughed. <laughs> I didn't say it to be funny. <laughs> I, I, I was we entertained. I was <laughs> singing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can move on. We can move on, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah. All right. We'll move it forward to another agenda. Thank you. Uh, F2. Um, <laughs> well, uh, this is really a follow. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead and go introduce ahead. it. Yeah. Th this is a discussion of the revision of board focus goals. This is really a follow-up to the mission statement. I mean, we should really have a mission statement in place first. Um, as we look back at the board focus goals, you know, we've been operating on these goals for a number of rounds here. We, uh, in fact, I included a sample of the board focus goals for one of our high schools. And you see the pages that, uh, that chart the progress of the school according to our district fo focus goals and we think that that's very useful although in general um, having the six major goals and then having all the sub goals uh, I think we have something like I don't know 26 different goals um, uh, is quite a few and it is important to focus and identify those that are most important to us and to continue with those. So on, on one hand, there should be some view toward continuing those that are most critical to us and really being serious about them and not diluting them with a lot of other goals. Um, well, I, I think that's best a board discussion that's to be had though after we've come to agreement about the mission statement. Well, I think well, they I think interact. I, I certainly do. Yeah. I think that, it, that it's a uh, circular process, mm -hmm. an iterative process. Even with, with these goals, they seem a bit blue sky to me, rather than strategies, rather than um, this is what we're going to do in the next year. And you're supposed to do these goals every year, I suppose, but we're, we don't do it that way. Instead, these are kind of we're going to do these. And it's not, and we can just keep these forever almost. Um, and I'm not, I, I guess I'm torn because one part of me just says, well, why can't we just have, okay, keep this in place because these are going to always be here. But what we want to do is say, what is it this next couple of months, what are we going to be doing, working on? And, you know, make a list of things we're going to work on. Right. I think that's a strategic plan. Well, in fact, we came back when we adopted these, we came back with a plan to achieve these. And at one point, I even gave you uh, an update on how we were doing, although we do that on a regular basis just as part of the, uh, the goal sheets that you see in the single plans, school by school. Uh, we gave you a lot of that information just in the Latino achievement. Uh, as many of those indicators were out of this. To my mind, uh, these are the accountability part of the mission statement. So the mission statement says, here's what we're pointed for generally. Uh, here's, the, here's the desiderata. And <laughs> this says, and we expect to achieve this and this and this. Well, well I, I like that. And, 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 I, and, and, uh, and so most of the language is pretty clear. Uh, I look for the infinitives. You know, the to do, to do, to this, to that. Mm -hmm. Then I can I can say, okay, uh, next question. Are, is it something that's that is uh, observable? Mm -hmm. Okay, and now I, th then I'm close to being able to say, yeah. And when we're d when we're done, we can hold we can hold ourselves accountable. To yes. That. And well, I think that should be a clear line of logic with every one of these. So our goal is we have a goal that is to do something, but not how we do it. That's, we leave up to others. I, I'm with you. That's what, that's a strategic plan, is, is, is it not? Is well, the, it's that's also, implementation. It, it's also uh, embedded in our SMART goals that are part of our LEAP document. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, mm -hmm. would you like to speak to that? I was, I was because waiting. we think we're developing a LEAP document uh, that's in alignment with these goals, and mm -hmm. we're about to bring that back to you at our next meeting because we need your approval to move ahead on the LEAP document. We've been revising it. Well, in many ways, those, uh, the LEAP uh, SMART goals and then the activities associated with it 
become uh, the board focus goals and the action plan or the strategic plan. But let, let me give yeah. just a, 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 an example. Here's one that says, to be improving student achievement, continues to be improving. Uh, that's just syntactical. We can change that and make that uh, measurable and, or clear statement. The next one, uh, up the very, the very top, very top. Uh, then, then there's one to ensure. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what that means, right. and uh, and so so that one doesn't doesn't do it for me. Uh, then to, then go down all the bullet lists and you and easily can you know you understand you've got a. a You've got a, the action that the verbs imply in, in all of those. Uh, except I'm not fond of the to, the to prepare all students to pass, the Cassie, to we pass. Un we understand <laughs> that as 100% yeah. will pass. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. I, I, I fully agree with what Bob is pointing out because when you look at these bullets, first of all, I think they're too numerous. Mm -hmm. You know, when you identify fewer, more critical uh, goals, you have a better chance of reaching them. But for instance, when you compare the, the, the first bullet to the third bullet, for instance, one is a very specific goal, exceeding federal AYP. Ensuring high levels of instruction in core subjects, how are you gonna, how are you gonna <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know what. Go, go what, to every class. Right, exactly. So <laughs> I'm, you know, we've joked about this mega goal in the past. Um, but I think that it should be refined based on what we can measure. Ms. Cordero. And, and, well, and, and what we deem to be more critical than other, more critical yeah. tasks than others. As much as I'm really uh, interested in how we, how we wordsmith these because I think they point us in the right direction, I kind of want to go back to what Dr. Noel was saying. I'm more concerned with how we achieve them um, and so I was, we had talked previously, at some point in the past, about having our agenda items reference the goals. And so I'm, I'm thinking if we, ha if we could add something to our agenda cover sheets, where we, we added, for example, um, where, what the fiscal impact would be and where, what fund that would come from, et cetera. If we could add what goal that particular agenda item is seeking to achieve and it could even be specific enough as to 1.1 or 1.2 um, where we are specifically looking at this is going to help students exceed the federal AYP uh, st uh, standards um, so that we're, we're when we're, tr we're constantly having these goals referenced for us because what what has tended to happen, I think all of us kind of fall into this, is we adopt the goals and we're very conscientious and we're very serious about the goals when we're adopting them and then we tend to put them aside and move on with business and not think about them too much anymore. Um, and so I think we want what we want to do is integrate them into our routine business. At least that's what I would like to do. I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't agree yeah, more strongly. I, th I think it's a great idea. I think it's going to have a, a, a actually maybe a different impact and that is we'll see how much of our agenda actually hews to <laughs> what our goals are as opposed to all other right. business that seems to demand our attention in the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. oh, can I, I was just going to make a comment earlier about what uh, Brian mentioned with SMART goals and Dr. Noel, I know that's what you're looking for, that, you know, the S-M-A-R, it's like specific, measurable, action-oriented, you know, time-bound, I can't remember what the R is, but those are the kinds of goals that we develop for the LEAP plans and for the school, school plans, but you have to be very specific. And as you were talking about how so many of these are combined, I'm thinking things like, you know, having, exceeding the federal AYP, the adequate yearly, um, progress and the API, those, if that's what our goal is, that's very measurable year to year. We know what the targets are. All of the other things come into play. That means that there's high levels of instruction. We're using data. It even goes into our English learner success. However, I feel like that's such, based on our data, that's so big. That needs to stay as a separate piece in there. But, so, but sometimes, the me, you, sometimes means are so important that you put them, 
you make them like into ends in themselves. I'm talking about like the uh, 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 data data based or, uh, uh, instruction, correct? Data driven instruction, right? That may be so important. You don't want to just say, well, we're, we want everybody to uh, all the schools to meet AYP. That implies data driven instruction. Maybe we want to be explicit about particular means which we're convinced have been proven effective and so on. Yeah, you can get, I think, as specific as you want in there. The plans, like Brian said, the LEAP, the local educational agency plans, and the school plans are very specific in actions, timelines, who's responsible, what it costs, and all of that. So, you know, depending on what you want to emphasize, you could add that in. Ms. Park, I agree with everybody's comments. Um, about this so far, I just really want to emphasize that I, I, uh, I think that this, you may have SMART goals that are what you're going to do for the coming year, but here in the focus goals, we need to be very specific about what our ultimate goal is, wh where it might be 100% um, passing the high school exit exam. You may know that next year your SMART goal might be 99% passing, but um, here is where we need to add more specifics, in my opinion, things like um, increasing participation across the demographic spectrum in advanced courses and academies. Um, I think that we need to think what is our what is our ultimate goal with that? What do we want that to look like? Then have some annual SMART goals that are tied into it, but here in the focus goals that needs to be really specific. This is where we want to be ultimately. And um, and then we can see that on our these really nice board focus goal data sheets that Dr. Hayden put together where they have, they show the state targets for things. When it comes to district, we don't exactly have targets. We can see that we haven't met them if they're below, if they've gone down. Mm -hmm. But since increase could have meant just increase by one, yeah. um, it's really not telling you. Right. It's like, yes, we met the goal, but is that really what our goal was? Right. Um, and so I would love for our principals to be able to see for this school next year, the board, is hoping that you'll get to, to this point. Um, you have SMART goals as part of the progress. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would really like to see that all put together um, so that we can all keep focused on it. I'm also wondering if, for some of the more amorphous ones, if it's possible to put surveys, um, internet surveys together that can, for staff and students, that might give us some information on an annual or um, every other year basis well actually that was my next question was I mean we are not going to decide today which ones to keep exactly. which ones to throw out which ones we want to add um, so I guess my question was about next steps um, number four five well, and six need, need syntactical changes to be made into mm -hmm. real goal statements right well I also want had a question about number five in that I don't I don't think we've gotten any kind of report on that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see what our staffing, uh, especially our staffing demographics, have looked like over a period of years, where they are now. Are we improving? Are we regressing? Are we staying the same? Um, and again, kind of like what Mrs. Parker was saying, um, have some real targets that we you know, know what we're trying to achieve. Um, so. Again, in that's an area where I feel like we haven't gotten very much information. We, that's we ha also one of the hardest ones to well, influence. Well, it, it, it may be the hardest one to influence, but it shouldn't be the hard. It shouldn't be particularly hard to give us the data. If you're t yes, if you're talking about highly qualified as far as having the right credentials and then having the CLAD or BCLAD, that is contained in right. the LEAP, and you'll see the elementaries next week. But I know this, I think this stands for more than that when we're saying highly qualified. Well, and we're also talking about underrepresented groups being part of our staff. Um, that should be fairly easy to, to report on as well. We can do that. Yeah, next steps. Where do we go? Um, <laughs> do we want to have another meeting about it? Is the, yeah. Uh, do you want an extra well, meeting? Do you do want to wait and, oh, go ahead. N no, what I was going to say is I, I honestly, as, as much as I would like to think we can throw this on for, you know, 30 minutes at another board meeting, I really don't think it's going to accomplish much of anything. No. Um, what we've done in the past is actually had a workshop devoted to this topic. 
um, it's another meeting, um, and maybe the timing is wrong. Maybe we shouldn't be doing it during July and August, but I, I personally think that it requires a workshop of, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to participate, and I think July is a wonderful time to have this kind of a workshop. Um, but I would also hope that we would all go and do some research. I mean, these, these focus goals and strategic plans are all available um, online at various uh, school districts, and some of them do. Sometimes it's in their focus goals and sometimes it's in their strategic plan, but they'll have very specific targets and they, they tie it all together. So I hope that we would all take a look at it before. Could I make yeah. a suggestion? And that is before we, you know, we, we end up choosing a date. Um, if our master researcher uh, might want to share some of that in an information sheet that's shared with all board members before we, I'd be happy to send that okay. out. So they can something to look at. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to request that if we have sites that we think are of particular um, value, that we could just send that information to each other. Um, without comment, et cetera, but just here's a site you might want to look at so we could all. Actually, I, I'd be more comfortable if it was shared with the superintendent okay. and then the superintendent and then disseminated it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Now, what do we do about a date? Do you want to do that? We well, do, you, do you want to start the uh, July meeting, the one meeting we have, since we don't anticipate uh, many expulsions a little earlier for some workshop time on this? Is that enough? I mean, that's not what we talked about. What you just mentioned was a three-hour period or something oh, like that. Oh, three hours? No, I, well, I said two, but two. I, I guess I also two. feel like, <laughs> you know, if you, if you start at 6 with a workshop and then you have a meeting from 7 until 10, that it makes the end of that meeting less productive. I'm just wondering about a, you know a, a late afternoon, um, you know, for two hours when yeah I it's think separate an separate and people are feeling more fresh. I also agree because I also think an alternate date. And uh, I, I sometimes worry that when we have a workshop before our uh, primary meeting, that we we um, tend to have our our attention pulled in too many different directions because we have other things on the agenda that we're also dealing with. I'd like to have a meeting kind of just devoted to this and two, you know, two or to three hours and then late afternoon probably Should is manageable. Should we board members with potential times? Yes. Okay. So the meeting, the board meeting is on July 8th. So we could say the following the 15th on a Tuesday afternoon. Or we could move in the other direction. Or move July, in the other. July 1. I'm out of town on July 1st. Oh, okay. I'm back on the 2nd, so the 3rd is fine. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you do an email query? I don't okay. have to even have a calendar with me. Will do. No, it doesn't have to be a Tuesday. We're, we're pretty... Um, I'm uh, We're probably very flexible. More flexible, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we have one last item on item on here, which is the first reading of changes to the administrative regulation, use of school facilities, F3. And Dave Hetjunk will present <coughs> this. We've talked to you about it just briefly before. Very briefly. Um, Every time you think you have everything covered in a regulation, you keep finding out you don't. Uh, two minor changes uh, request that the board consider. The first has to do with PTA and PTO fundraisers. Our current policy says that board approved fundraisers will not incur any civic center costs except for any necessary custodial or other uh, nutrition services workers, personnel may be required. And it came to my attention that PTO and PTA fundraisers don't come before the board for approval like school fundraisers do. So I'd like to amend the policy for that, uh, to just as a clarification. Also as a clarification on our uh, full uh, fair market value, just uh, when we changed the policy uh, last time, 
we changed the policy so that basically nonprofits could have a more affordable rate and the, I, and groups that were not nonprofits would have a more affordable rate to provide activities for youths and everybody would pay a minor fee to help offset uh, the district general fund which pays for utilities and maintenance of the fields and we felt that the board uh, would support that and did support that uh, for activities for youth but then we also have other people that would love to use district property for fundraisers to benefit those or their own organizations and for that we charge full market rate even if they are a nonprofit based on the fact that they're not doing an activity for youth they're doing fundraising for their organization and to that end just a clarification to uh, delete the words or for charitable purposes that was left in the last time we made a revision if the board has no objections to either of these I'd propose that we bring this back as a consent item on the next agenda to save time no I think they're great changes and I actually had a couple more that that I wanted to suggest um, uh, one is under direct cost use it talks about nonprofit organizations clubs or associations organized to promote activities for school-aged children I recently had someone argue to me that a student being a spectator at an event qualified as promoting activities for school-aged children <laughs> and I mean I didn't buy it but I think that maybe we ought to be clarifying what an activity is for school-aged children and well I, no I don't I wrote a bunch of, of, of notes to myself I, I mean I was think they were talking about a sporting event it could also be a play or whatever but to my mind that's very different than for instance um, uh, someone who's doing a play but then also does a clinic or a master class for Maybe we can stick students. the word participation in there somehow. Participation That's what or I was engagement thinking. or some word like that where students are engaged in. I was thinking if we took out to promote activities and said to promote active participation okay, there you for school-aged children. Thank you. Something like that. But it could be a fundraiser that provides money for other children. Is that correct? Typic, typic, the way the policy no. reads right now, if anybody wanted to come in and conduct a fundraiser on school district property to increase their balance sheet, they would be charged the fair market right. rate. But Unless if it was that a fundraiser was an activity that, that in which youth participated, such as if you had a, a youth game mm. and you charge admission, uh, uh, no, not, not even that. That would still be fair market value. I, I guess if the fundraiser was a school activity, was board approved, it would be no cost. If it's not a board approved fundraiser for the school district and it's for all of the other organizations in town, it, it's up to the board's discretion on whether they want to be compensated or whether they, with, or whether they want to use the general fund to uh, augment everybody else's bottom line well I was trying to think of an example of what might fit in that category of where of you don't charge admission but I'm thinking what if like um, you know uh, city at rest or city at peace I'm sorry um, <laughs> had decided they wanted to do like a, a car wash and or or maybe uh, let me let me take something else a jogathon they want to use our facilities. They're not charging uh, any kind of fee. They are doing it as a fundraiser, though. And it's all the students who are participating in it. Would that qualify under direct mm -hmm. cost use? That or would, would that be that marked would, that fair market? That would probably be a use other than categorized above, which is the first bullet mm -hmm. under fair market. So it would be fair market. Yeah. And okay. what would women, the money goes to something that. Uh, for youth, though, does it matter? Or yes, know? it does matter. And I, I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry. I feel like I'm being vehement about this because I've had several interactions with community members <laughs> who <laughs> wanted to fundraise, <laughs> and it was loosely to benefit young people, but not. It, it, it was bottom line a fundraiser for their organization. Um, and no matter how you slice it or dice it, it's still a fundraiser, not for a purpose that is necessarily designated 100 percent 
for the benefit of our students. So, but if it was for us, if somebody decided, some nonprofit came in and decided to do a fundraiser that provides funds for our schools for whatever reason. Also questionable, and this came up at another, it was at an elementary school where a community member led a fundraiser for the benefit of a particular staff member. Ooh. And it, 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 it That's was, not the same. It either. was. It became very, very muddy. Um, I think that this is much cleaner. And if for some reason there is some potential exception to any of the rules that have been drafted, then it would come to facilities and to the superintendent. Okay. The direct cost comes into play when, for instance, um, uh, oh, uh, the, like the water polo foundation pays for the use of the swimming pool uh, for their their practices it's not a fundraiser the cost goes directly to uh, for the you know the use of the pool there's it's coming out of their pocket to pay for for pool use and an organization would uh, an organization wanting to do a, a car wash would have been a good example except that due to our uh, <laughs> due, 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 due to our stormwater permit, we're not allowed to have car washes on any school district property. If an organization wants a car wash, they have to go off our district property to a gas station or something like that. Because we're such a large entity, we fall under the same rules as, as cities and counties in that we have a, a stormwater prevention uh, uh, obligation. That's why I smiled when you said car washes. Not, not that I was laughing at you. I was just, it was just a, a great example of, of, of the one thing we're trying to, to still get out to the schools that you can't do this on school district property. <laughs> yes, I, I understand, thanks. <laughs> I think you can safely bring it back on consent. Is that, yes, Thank so you. next time. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had, I'm sorry, oh. I'm really sorry. I had one more change. And I don't know where it would be appropriate to put it, Mr. Hetyank, um, but when uh, people uh, apply for civic center permits, or an organization does for the use of a facility, um, it filters down to the principal and other school personnel. And there's no timeline specified in here on how long they can sit on the request. I mean, you can effectively right. deny the request by sitting on it for, uh, an unlimited period of time and and we've received a number of complaints based yeah. on that and that and we're working with with back. with with the sites and we're working with the civic center office to set up a spreadsheet that reminds us when things don't come back in a in a timely manner prior to the scheduled event we also have a problem with people think they can walk down to the Civic Center office and fill out a permit for an event the next day, and it just doesn't happen that quick. No, and that's <laughs> not, but I'm, I'm wondering yeah. if we should be specifying a timeline. Well, in, in both directions. Yes, like, I agree. You must I have think it in X number you must of apply, days before you know, yeah. that, and you will have a response X number of days after. I think it would be nice to have yeah, a right timeline. Up front in the application. And yes. Then in Okay. Usually, usually the thing that delays response. the application the most is the user getting us the insurance requirements, yes. to be honest with you. That is typically the delay. Oh, I have to have insurance. Yes, you do. Contact your insurance, insurance agent for your, for your homeowner's policy, and that's typically what delays getting a, a, a civic center application approved. Uh, very, very, I don't want to say very seldom, but, but most of the time it's not that the the site administrator in charge of facilities or, or the principal or another staff member delays it, although that has happened on occasion. It's not, it's not the main cause of delay, but we can put some timelines in here. Well, I, I think that having the timelines specified in the policy um, also helps when there are complaints. You can show, you can, I, you can refer to those particular and maybe Parts it should just policy. make it really clear that it's a, it needs to be a complete application before yeah. Yeah. the time exactly. kicks in. Yeah, because, uh, because basically a, a we, we could send it, we send it to the site, and if the site son, signs off and it comes back to the office, it sits, but I don't approve it until the insurance information comes in. And so sometimes we're perceived as delaying. Okay, okay. we can do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're at the end of the meeting. It is only 6.15. Um, Lakers. We could spend an hour on the goals, but I'm, I'm sensing a uh, need to, to, to evaluate it and come back.
Okay, and we will do that. So we will be back. Um, our next meeting is next week. So we'll see you then. 6.15.